Hello and welcome to today's training, Treating the Family, Addressing Family Accommodation in the Treatment of OCD with Dr. Jamie Gotcha, PhD and Miss Laura Lockers, LMSW. I am Helen Heyman, Director of Programs at ADAA. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio panel and the dial-in information will be displayed. We will first kindly ask you to mute yourselves so that we don't hear any background noise. To mute yourself, you will need to press the gray tab just below the red arrow. Kindly also switch off your webcam. The webcam tab is just below the mute tab. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter. Excuse me a second. Today's presenter um, through the chat panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. You will also be able to access materials. If you registered and paid for continuing education credit, you will first need to provide the four letter CE code on the webinar evaluation form. The link to the evaluation form in SurveyMonkey will be sent to you 48 hours after the end of the professional webinar. You can either answer the post assessment questions at the end of this webinar by staying online. The assessment questions will appear at the very end. And at the end of the talk, a screen will come up with these questions. You will have five minutes to answer them. Once you did, please click the submit button. And now I would like to introduce our experts. Dr. Jamie Socha, PhD, is a licensed clinical psychologist at the Anxiety and OCD Treatment Center of Ann Harbor, where she, she specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders, OCD, and obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders. Dr. Socha received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science and completed her internship and postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Michigan. Dr. Socha has extensive experience and training in a variety of empirically supported treatments for anxiety and mood disorders, including cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure and response prevention. She works with individuals across the lifespan, having specialized training in treating both anxiety in pediatric and adult populations. Dr. Socha is also clinical supervisor at the University of Michigan's Mary A. Rackham Institute. Dr. Socha was a 2016 recipient of ADA's Career Development Leadership Program Award. She's also an ADA member since several years. Ms. Laura Lockers, LMSW, is a licensed clinical social worker and worked in the University of Michigan's Department of Psychiatry Anxiety Disorders Program for 10 years before co-founding the Anxiety and OCD Center of Ann Harbor. Ms. Lockers received her master's degree from the University of Michigan School of Social Work in 2005 and has specialized training in cognitive behavioral therapy for a variety of anxiety, mood disorders, and OCD. Ms. Lockers has had advanced training experience working with obsessive compulsive disorder, including intensive outpatient exposure and response prevention for aggressive OCD symptoms. In addition to clinical treatment and clinical training, Ms. Lockers has also been involved in clinical research, primarily in the area of obsessive compulsive disorder and OC spectrum disorders. She's an adjunct professor at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Ms. Lockers has been an ADA professional member since several years. It is a true honor and pleasure to work with these two professionals. I will now pass the screen along to Dr. Socha and Dr. Ms. Lockers. 
Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, pull up our presentation. How does that look? Good. Um, so welcome everybody and, and thank you, Holland, for the introduction and uh, for all your help organizing this today. Uh, so Laura and I are going to talk today about um, family accommodation of, um, of OCD, which I'm sure most of you know is the norm rather than the exception. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit today about how we address that um, uh, across the lifespan. Um, if you have any questions, please jot them down, um, send them to Helen, and of course, we'll leave some time at the end to, to answer those. Uh, uh, Laura and I have no um, uh, conflicts of interest to report. Uh, just a brief mention of our learning objectives for today or what we hope you can uh, walk away from after this brief webinar. First, uh, that you'll be able to define what family accommodation is um, and, and be able to describe the, the many forms um, that it can take. Uh, you'll also be able to recognize some of the, the red flags uh, of accommodation. A lot of times um, clients or family will come in not even recognizing these behaviors as accommodating themselves or maybe reluctant to disclose. So during your clinical interview, um, keeping your, your, your eyes and your ears open to recognizing some of those things so you can address that in treatment. Uh, we'll talk about useful language to use with family members. Language really seems to matter in, in getting families and, and clients on board for this. So um, what you can say, say to address some of their, their concerns, their worries, their fears, um, and really get people motivated to do, to do the hard work. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about why uh, addressing accommodation is such a challenge for clinicians. It's a lot of work and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and so we'll talk about um, some things to keep in mind and, um, and what you can do. I think why that challenge is so important to take on. It's one that we're finding increasingly isn't necessarily being addressed, so. Absolutely, right. Uh, even families who've had treatment for OCD before, but not addressing the family component. So, so we're often doing this work for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just a, a quick definition on, on, on what, we, what we mean when we say family accommodation. So this is any way in which family members play a role in maintaining the obsessions and compulsions. Um, Laura's gonna talk in a moment about kind of some specific examples, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some of the, the main categories uh, first is taking part in the rituals. So I think this is the thing we think of, um, you know, kind of you know, right off the top of our heads when we're thinking about what does accommodation look like. So it's the, the family member who's engaged in the decontamination rituals and process for their family member afraid of germs and illness. Um, it can also look like permitting avoidance. So we see this probably most in our parents who are anxious about their kids being anxious. Uh, and so they, they really do anything uh, to make sure that triggers or difficult situations don't arise so that they can keep the OCD at bay. Uh, another form is modifying routines to accommodate the OCD. So really upending the processes that people do on a daily basis, uh, going to school, bedtime, often leaving, just leaving room for the compulsions and rituals to, to occur. And then last, uh, what we call covert reassurance, which I think is the, it's certainly the most subtle, most uh, overlooked perhaps um, form of accommodation. Laura will give you some interesting examples, but this is really just any way family members reassure, you're okay, it's fine, you're safe but it happens through kind of clever and indirect means from the individual with OCD so that family members often don't even know that they're doing. So some of the, the examples we have, I think hiding or removing triggers is, is really common. I mean, obvious ones are taking away objects that may be used as, as weapons or taking away trigger topics. I had a parent yesterday who um, they've made a family rule that they don't talk about anything health related because it sets off their daughter's OCD at the dinner table. So, um, and likewise, they're also not allowed to watch any TV shows that uh, take place in any hospital. Mm -hmm. So that's a perfect example of, of removing those triggers. Cleaning and sanitizing, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, and generally it's allowing, either allowing or accommodating extra washing or actually doing it for them yourselves. Um, there's often 
mixed in with that, I think there's often a lot of direct reassurance too of, is this safe for me to touch? Do you think I'm going to get sick? Is this okay? Um, I, certainly any, any kind of repeated questioning. The covert ones, I, 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 I think we always find to be so interesting because it's amazing how clever OCD can be and how clever our, our patients can be to find a workaround. Um, I think these are ways where patients are, have learned and probably know their family members, especially parents have been directed to not any question more than once. Um, that's our rule, you can time, but then from there on out, we're gonna say, I'm sorry, that's just your OCD. Um, so I had a kid that he worried that his mom might steal something and in a store and wanted to make sure she was not breaking any rules. Uh, so in the past, he would ask, you know, did you pay for that? Did you pay for everything? Can I see the receipt? Are you sure you paid for it? Um, it you know, he realized really quickly that had been blocked and mom appeared in session and said, oh, he's been doing great. And when I asked, does he ask any questions when you're there? She said, well, but not about OCD things. I said, tell me what he asks. And it turned out that he would say, oh, hey, mom, I forgot my watch. Is it in your purse? And she'd say, oh, yeah, it's right here with my wallet. Hmm. That was his way of finding out if mom had her wallet. And that made him feel better because he felt like if her wallet was there, then she probably paid. So that's a perfect example of this covert reassurance. And um, I've had a... a uh, person with re relationship based OCD um, that would call or text his girlfriend to ask how if she had fed the dog or taken the dog out when really that was a replacement for saying, are you still thinking about me? Are you OK? Are we still a happy couple? Mm -hmm. uh, so those kind of things, we usually have to do a lot of education with the family to help them even realize that it's happening because they're usually shocked when they realize they've been <laughs> absolutely they've been doing this. this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, taking responsibility, this one happens, and two, this one's actually tough for family because it, it's a secondary gain for them as well. It, you know, I'm getting out of the door faster. If I am the last one to leave the house, I am, you know, able to manage the house better with fewer tantrums, be it from adults or children, if I just do the laundry. So uh, family members often take over responsibility. Uh Providing means, I think that's just really allowing it, saying, I'm okay if we're late. I'm okay if we are, are going to um, not be able to go to this thing because the rituals are going to take extra time. Avoidance, as we mentioned, you know, just even allowing this to happen. And the censorship goes back to the, the topics. The, the problem we have with family accommodation, and this is one of the things that has made us start to look at it more and more, um, even in creating the family accommodation group um, that our, one of our colleagues runs, is because it's clearly linked through research to gradum symptom severity, poor response to treatment, more functional impairment, poor quality of life for relatives, and higher rates of family psychopathology. Um, I think when measured in studies, Family accommodation is extraordinarily prevalent, especially uh, in 90 percent endorse at least one form of accommodation. But it, particularly in these severe cases that often are not responding well to treatment, we send, tend to see these higher rates of family accommodation. Uh, I think that was most prominent when, when our colleagues started this group and we anticipated it being for parents of young children and almost the entire group was parents of adults. So, you know, this is, it's pretty clear if you don't address this early on, it doesn't matter how much ERP the individual does. If the system doesn't change, the OCD doesn't change. So why is it a challenge for clinicians? I think that it's a challenge and it's one of those things um, for those of us that do ERP, we're very direct and let's get in there and treat the OCD. And this is a different skill set. I mean, this is essentially family therapy. It's a lot of working with a group, I think resisting family members who are either anxious about the anxiety that we are <laughs> encouraging their family members to experience or anxious about dealing with some of their own issues, be it dependence or a need for being wanted, whatever that may be. Um, and it's also difficult to recognize. Sometimes uh, it's involving multiple family members, so it can be a complicated system that's, that's definitely a challenge to address. 
Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about assessment now. In a moment, I'll kind of talk about the, um, uh, you know, what to include in your, your clinical interview when you're meeting with families, uh, learning about their family system, etc. Um, but I did want to note uh, some of the, the kind of the validated instruments for um, assessing um, accommodation, and and um, these are these are very good and and very helpful and even looking at the items to begin to kind of understand what, what you're looking for, what are some of the, the forms or examples of accommodation. So there's the, the family accommodation scale for OCD, which kind of lists different examples and does the person endorse that or not endorse that. The OCD family functioning scale, um, also looking at types of accommodation, but uh, the degree of impairment perhaps too on the, the family's overall functioning because of accommodation. And then there is a family accommodation and impact scale, and I know this one is um, included in the um, in the in the protocol for the in the treatments that work series for mm -hmm. uh, family based uh, therapy for childhood OCD. Um, so, what can you ask? So these are some of the questions that we might include in our kind of initial assessment. Um, these are kind of written. Um, uh, as though you are asking family members, but I think you could also switch these to kind of um, ask, ask the client uh, what, what would their answers be to these questions as well. But for example, what things do you do that you wouldn't do if your loved one didn't have OCD? So I think this is really getting getting at like, what are the behaviors themselves? Like what form is accommodation taking place for this family? Um, what are they doing because OCD is part of the picture? Uh, the next one is, is how much time do you spend on reducing anxiety for a family member? And it's an interesting way of putting it because we're not saying how much time do you reassure or how much time do you engage in rituals, but really identifying that that behavior serves the function of reducing their anxiety. So it kind of, you, you get, you'll get a little bit of the, uh, you know, the frequency, the severity maybe of how much accommodation is taking place um, and, and, and just how much time family members are probably um, engaging in these behaviors. And I'm interrupting you for yeah. a second, but I think that is a critical piece mm -hmm. in, in how families understand family accommodation is even saying how much time do you spend reducing anxiety? Because I've had parents who say, I don't spend that much time doing rituals. Mm -hmm. But when I say that, they're spending lots of time saying, you're okay, you're safe. I'm you supporting. Can, you can, right. Yeah, it's supporting where they're interpreting it as supporting, but we are interpreting it as family accommodation. Right. So it's a, it's a, div, a very different shift. Absolutely. Um, we'll also ask too how often you are late for events due to waiting on fam your family member. Uh, so this gets at that modifying routines category, um, really leaving room to, to um, engage in the compulsions. Um, another question I really like is what do you say when your family member is distressed? So really getting at the language that they use. So even going back to, to Laura's example of um, you know, the mom says, oh, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not providing reassurance. But when you ask her what specifically she's saying, you're getting a better idea of what the function of that is um, and things that family members might, might not even be aware of. Uh, do you make decisions or complete tasks for your loved one? So this is kind of the avoidance, um, kind of, you know, permitting not going near those triggers. And then the last one is, what do you do to avoid conflict with your loved one? Um, now, this I think these are our, kind of the walking on eggshells families who know that asking the person to do something that you know, OCD has some, some rules about is going to cause a problem and a conflict. And so their motivation is to avoid that. Their motivation is to keep the peace, um, but still accommodating the OCD. Um, so these are the red flags that we mentioned. Um, things to kind of be on the lookout for when you're doing the assessment. I think ideally you have a you know you have a family or a client come in and they they have good insight into what accommodation is occurring, but uh, I think that that's the rare case. Um, and and the norm is that people may not even be understanding yet um, how, how accommodation looks for their family. I would have to say that number one is parental anxiety. Um, which makes sense. So you see a parent come in and they're very anxious about their kid being anxious. They're anxious about the, the prospect of ERP. They know it's the treatment that works, but it's very scary to think about, you know, engaging, uh, engaging this or being their, their child's coach during this process. So clearly when this is going on, accommodation is serving the dual role of, you know, uh, 
listening to the OCD, but also regulating the parent's emotional stage too. So that's often you know, a really strong driver. And so this is something that, that, that we know we have to address with parents as, as well. Um, and another reason that it's good to include them in our sessions yes. so they can, they can see this process um, taking place. Yeah, I think that's so helpful when they can see us respond during exposures. I mean, that's one of the things I find most helpful for the parental anxiety is realizing that this other approach actually works because they have the anxious ones have so much doubt, right, that it could work. Right. Um, I also put on here, you know, comorbid um, you know, presentation or a history of separation anxiety disorder. I think there's some research that um, that shows that among the the non-OCD uh, pediatric uh, anxiety disorder, separation anxiety, has the, the highest degree of accommodation, which makes sense. It's also kind of a, a parent-bound disorder. Uh, so if, if I know that this has happened or taken place, um, I'm kind of either wondering or hypothesizing that perhaps accommodation has been a way that this family has you know, kept the peace or um, kind of regulated the anxiety. And so I'm wondering if this is perhaps also happening with OCD. Uh, siblings or other family members in the household with anxiety, but similar to parent anxiety, but um, if there's anybody in the family system in which uh, OCD activates their own anxiety and that accommodation might be a way for them to regulate that themselves. Um, interpersonal discord between family members, well, it, not necessarily because of accommodation. I, I've, I've always got my ears kind of open for that and um, want to know what role accommodation might be playing. A lot of times people make the, the person with OCD makes the request, the, the family member knows it's probably not a good idea to be doing this, they might resist it, they might fight, eventually give in, but it's a pretty contentious process. Um, I see this a lot actually with siblings, so there's sibling um, discord going on. Uh, the sibling's pretty frustrated uh, uh, about what's been going on in the family, pretty frustrated with their parents. Um, parents might not be making the connection that that discord is around the OCD, but certainly something that we're, we're attuned to. And then the last thing I have on here is uh, resistant to the diagnosis, so saying this, this anxiety isn't OCD, or a minimization of the severity. Um, you know, a red flag, but maybe also, um, a, you know, a negative kind of prognostic indicator. I think if, if somebody is not seeing this anxiety as OCD, they're, they're not seeing also the rationale that the behaviors are forms of accommodation of that OCD. And so when we're asking them to, 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 to eliminate this, we don't have that buy-in and connecting it as a response or listening to the OCD. I think that that, that serves a, a pretty, pretty big barrier. Um, and then this one, uh, this slide lists some of the reasons why are, why are people reluctant to eliminate, um, eliminate accommodation. So I put kind of, you know, four, four common things you might see. I think um, one or more could be operating. This is something we're always interweaving into our conceptualization. Knowing what things are operating for a family is, is absolutely determining your approach with them. So one, and you know, Laura mentioned this a moment, but I think this is, this is a, a, a probably a point that we highlight a lot is that family members are viewing accommodation as supportive. Um, our goal is to redefine what supportive really means. And so we'll say things, OCD plays by a different rule book, and this rule book, not engaging and ignoring, is supportive, um, and kind of appeal to their, their their greater goals or values of creating a or raising a kind of resilient, autonomous child, and that accommodation is going to get in the way of that. Uh, a worry about hurting or traumatizing family their family member. I think I see this a lot with um, parents of the of younger children. I'm going to say traumatizing people hear most right. younger kids. Younger kids. Hurting, I think, is right. the universal. But right. But traumatizing. Like, them. my kid is vulnerable. <laughs> and uh, to even engage in um, intrusive thought exposures or really, you know, let these thoughts reach the light of day is uh, a scary thing for the, for, the, for the parent. And so you might be, see some resistance precisely because they're viewing it as, as protection. So we want to dispel some of those myths, and we'll talk about doing that um, shortly. Uh, next is a fear of the family member with OCD getting upset or angry. Um, again, these, these can be the walking on eggshells. It just makes my life easier if I do what you say because it's so much harder if I make you upset or angry. Clearly long-term that perpetuates the cycle, but it's a pretty strong motivator in the moment. 
And then last is the intolerance of witnessing an anxious family member. So going back to this accommodation being a way that the family member regulates their own emotional state and that it is difficult for, for them to see the, to see the anxiety. Uh, a slide that I like to use with families, particularly parents. So, you know, this is, I think you're going to start to see some of like the, uh, perhaps some of the family therapy ideas infused in here too, but we talk about the good cop, bad cop family dynamic um, in response to, to OCD. So the good cops, clearly this is where the accommodation is taking place. Uh, they are, are permissive. They let OCD call the shots because it's going to make the person feel safer. Um, my air quotes, safer. Uh, there's a lot more emotional over-involvement, which I really just see as kind of developmentally inappropriate levels of trying to regulate that person's emotional state, um, trying to take that task over. Uh, a lot of intrusiveness. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, where, what are you doing? Really checking to see if the, the OCD is present, probably to make it um, to make it go away. And the, one of the keys here, I think, to the good cop is that the, the attribution they're really making to to the behavior or the bad behaviors that they see in, in, their, in their children uh, is really an, an external attribution. So this is the OCD. This is the illness. My 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 child, my family member is a victim of this, and I've got to do everything that I can to save them from that. On the other side is the bad cop. So this is the person that's kind of rejecting the OCD, but in a pretty extreme form. So they're, they're quite harsh, they're quite, quite critical, um, hostile towards the individual with, uh, with OCD, clearly not providing the support, but rejecting any type of, um, uh, I think, positive interaction with a family member. Um, what they're often doing is making an internal attribution so that this, the OCD is, um, uh, it, it's in the person, right? The person is not being strong enough. They're not trying hard enough. Um, if only they would do that, that this would all go away. And so I'm mad at them for that. So with this, this um, uh, you know, kind of a spectrum from good cop to bad cop, we talk about getting family members closer to, to the middle and how to be supportive, for instance, without accommodating. Um, and also note that, you know, I think I often talk about this with parents, but it can really be, it can be other family members. I have a case right now where both parents seem to be good cop, but a bad cop is a sibling, right? So, but kind of knowing where everybody is falling. Uh, they, they, they do, too. they do. And, <laughs> right, that which was, one gets worse, which was, the other one gets worse. Right, which is my, it, I think if it reminded me, I think the other point we'll make with families too, is that the, the reason they're at, at this extreme is because they're, they're pushing each other this way, right? The bad cop sees the good cop being too good. The good cop sees the bad cop being too bad. And so they kind of keep pushing, pushing to the extremes and nobody's really in the middle. So I think we're, we're going to try and think about a step-by-step -step process. Um, it, we try to make family accommodation as much a part of our everyday ERP. So it's not, we're going to reserve this for some cases, because I think we've increasingly seen it happens enough that we just want to make it a part of uh, the treatment. So the, the first step is often a psychoeducational session of just trying to help families understand what does OCD look like? How are they responding? What are ways they can be supportive without engaging in um, rituals for OCD. We have a um, class that we've developed here that's a four-week group for family members, which we found to be quite helpful. But individually, I think we all have at least one of these psychoeducation mm -hmm. sessions as close to the beginning of treatment as possible. Mm -hmm. um, helping them really understand why are we removing it. Uh, we've got some some examples we've given to parents of like supporting a child without anxiety often looks very different than supporting a child with OCD mm -hmm. uh, and that they have to make that shift in their mind of what may be okay for one kid is actually hurtful for another kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, addressing their anxiety. I think a lot of psychoeducation about why are we doing these things, uh, all of the misconceptions about 
you know, are we going to create more symptoms? Are we going to traumatize them? Are we going to uh, make the thoughts stick more if we do exposure? All of those things are addressed because if parents are afraid of the treatment, I I've seen many, many times where I can get kids on board like that and parents are sort of subtly, oh, are you sure you have to do it that much? Maybe it's okay if you skip a day or that's kind of a scary thought. Maybe we can change it. So I think we have no idea how often that's happening if we're not addressing it. So really making sure that family is equally on board. Um, giving them tools. That's the biggest thing I hear from family members is, okay, I need you to tell me what to say because now I'm learning all the things I'm not supposed to say, but I don't know what to do. This also helps, I think, in the taking some of that bad cop dynamic out because I am the one saying these are the family rules uh, and parents, especially anxious parents, I think that's very relieving for them when they are like, but these are the rules that Laura set for all of us. This is what we're supposed to do in these situations when OCD is flaring up. So it's less of a mom is just being mean and more of a mom is following the protocol and not willing to do things that are going to make me sicker. So giving parents that language to use in the moment is, is hugely important, our family members in general. Um, I think, again, having everyone involved in the plan, that has to absolutely be universal. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. And the new rules are, are critical. Um, like with the family I mentioned, we talked about our new rules yesterday, like our new rules are kids are not banned from talking about things. Uh, and if we have a topic that triggers a thought, then we will deal with that. But the new rule is we don't ban conversations. So, you know, you really got to look at, and I think what Jamie keeps saying is the function of the behavior. The behavior is doing something for that family. There's something about it that's working. And if you don't address that in the shift of new rules of saying, okay, here's what it's going to look like, and here's how we're going to help you make that adjustment. We just find it doesn't happen, or it, it happens for a little while, but it doesn't stick. I think this is me, this is me again. Okay. I'll, give, I'll give you a turn to talk again. <laughs> um, uh, so this next portion is, is step one, which is recognizing the accommodation. So I, I kind of think of this as our um, uh, psycho-ed stage, certainly. A lot of information, a lot of really uh, reframing what this accommodation is doing for their loved one. So um, those of you who are uh, maybe familiar with, with some family therapy concepts might recognize this as this Cartman's drama triangle. I really like this and I, I see so many parallels with, uh, with OCD. So in the original drama, drama triangle, there's the idea of a victim or the person who is suffering. Um, uh, you know, feeling pain, distressed, need saving. There is the persecutor, the, the, the one who is kind of making life miserable for the victim. And then of course there is the rescuer who comes in and saves the day and makes, makes that all go away. And clearly you can see the parallels here to the patient being the victim, the family member being the rescuer when they engage in accommodation, the persecutor um, being OCD, right? Uh, the key here, though, is that um, everybody's responses kind of keep everybody stuck in certain roles. And one of the things that we'll often see in family members is the things that they're doing are actually really maintaining the, the, their loved one's position in that victim role, right? So they're sending the message, you do need saving from your OCD. Your OCD is, is, is right on that one. That is dangerous. That is a dangerous thought. Um, and whenever I accommodate... Um, or listen to the OCD, uh, I agree that that's a valid point, right? And so that 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 patient, that victim is going to say, well, I, I, I do need this. I need you to, to accommodate. I need you to take this role. And everybody's kind of stuck then in this, um, this dynamic. So it's, I, I just find that this is a good way to to present this to families. And there's something in there about the that rescuer role for, for family members that we're able to say, I get it. It's, it's well-intentioned, but it's really unhelpful um, in the long run. So, so I get why you're feeling that pull, but, but let's look at the longer term consequences and give you some other um, options or alternatives that are going to help break you free from that cycle. Um, uh, this, this I'll kind of either draw or have a handout uh, describing the accommodation cycle. There's probably a, you know, different ways you could illustrate this, but I think these are some of the, the key points in the, in the key phases. And, Often having the, a, a visual for family members um, 
helps them see each step in the process. And the real the, the reason I like um, you know graphics like this is that I can say to somebody, okay, well we know our points of intervention now. Like where in this circle can we say you can you can get out of this, right? So with that accommodation piece, often is that 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 kind of getting in. Uh, uh, square, right? Like things keep going as soon as you do that. We can help you get out of that with a different different response. So clearly begins with the anxiety that the individual those OCD experiences. There's some demand for accommodation to to make it make it go away. Um, like I said, I think family members can oftentimes they can have some sort of intellectual sense that maybe that's not the most helpful thing for me to do, but I know it's going to work really quick and it's going to make that anxiety go away. So, so okay. I think especially early, early on as these behaviors are emerging, everybody experiences short-term relief, not just the individual with OCD, but the family members experience relief uh, because that anxiety is kind of, uh, you know, reduced tensions. Um, the reduction in anxiety has helped people feel at ease at home. Uh, at that point, accommodation or requests for accommodation certainly become a go-to strategy. This is what I'm going to do. This is what's going to regulate my anxiety. Mom, dad, loved one, brother, sister, husband, wife. Um, I need you to do this to keep my anxiety down. Over time, inevitably, there's that resentment and discord that that um, develops as everybody kind of feels trapped and feels stuck in the and and having to listen to OCD. Now you've you've kind of fed the beast, and if it, if accommodation doesn't take place, you're, you're, you're going to probably get a lot of pushback from your loved one. I find that defiance then uh, can kind of set in or, or really it's the patient arguing on the side of, of OCD, you know, this is why you need to do this. This is why you need to keep me safe. Um, and I'm mad that you're not doing that. And with that defiance and the siding with OCD, there's more buy-in to the OCD. Um, symptoms continue and the cycle kind of so, like I said, I'd like to point to each of these. I often like to use maybe a, uh, an example of accommodation in the past week, talk about how that looked, what people were thinking, doing, and how that kind of fits this, uh, this particular cycle. So good helping families recognize what accommodation looks like for them. So I think the, the idea, and we've mentioned this a couple of times, so I, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I've got this as an example because this are, people often ask when we do these talks, what are the differences? I think that it is totally okay. One of the biggest differences is without OCD, parents are allowed to do a lot of logic-based discussion. That does nothing for OCD. In fact, it often makes these things worse. So that's one of the the core things that I come back to a lot of times. Um, but these are some examples that you could certainly go over with family members to explain these differences. Um, I think that it, a lot of these go back to uh, the assessment questions we had about you know, what would life be like if you weren't uh, dealing with OCD. One of the questions I ask often is a ritual versus a routine. A ritual is not easily changed uh, and is not a choice. A routine is something that's very easily changed and is a choice. So trying to distinguish between these things, this is, these are questions to ask on how to determine is this OCD or is this not. Um, prove it to me exposures are something we do a lot whenever we have families who say, oh, that's not a problem, or I don't think that would be that hard. Uh, so we'll actually assign, okay, well, that could be a prove it to me exposure for the week is let's try it or let's do it in session. Uh, I, I tend to not take their word on it <laughs> most of the time. Um, I also like to see how family members are going to react with an exposure. So prove it to me exposures with parents in the room or loved ones in the room. Mm -hmm. Give me an opportunity to see how they're naturally responding if they are instinctively, you know, giving them that sympathetic look the whole time or reaching out or nodding and encouraging, um, not being able to just watch. That tells us a lot. Absolutely. Uh, I think these are just some of the common myths about ERP. I think that uh, the thoughts are abnormal. This is probably the thing I spend the most amount of time educating family members on is that when it comes to OCD, the content of the thoughts are irrelevant. The problem is 
the interpretation of the thoughts. Every person has these intrusive thoughts. The only difference is, is that the mechanism that is supposed to say, okay, that's a weird thought, I wanna move on, it doesn't work with OCD. And that they interpret these thoughts as being much more meaningful and powerful. So I think that that is, that is something you have to come back to again and again, especially when there are thoughts that are very emotionally charged for the parents, like um, self-harm thoughts, harm thoughts, sexual thoughts, those kind of things. Uh, the support issue comes in again and again. Uh, the example I give to families that, that is often very shocking to them, but very effective is I say, you know, you've got to think about a ritual. It's kind of like giving your child heroin. If they were a heroin addict, it absolutely is going to make them feel better, but it is also going to contribute to them being an addict for the rest of their life. So you've got to ask, am I more invested in me feeling better in this moment and them feeling better for this moment or us having a lifetime of feeling better by tolerating the distress right now? Um, that's something that is very hard for families to make that shift, but <clears throat> that, ex that example might seem extreme, but it's absolutely in line with what we see uh, happen in the, in the long-term prognosis. Um, exposures are too overwhelming. I think this is where we're talking about some of that secondary family dynamics of often this is the, the cycle and parents see themselves as supporting their loved one when really they're sending a message you can't handle things. You are you are very fragile, and we want to send send the opposite message. So, um, helping parents see the fact that their loved one is struggling uh, and going through pain that that's an opportunity rather than as something terrible to be endured. That's a big cognitive shift, and um, that's one. If they can see it as an opportunity, they're a lot more willing to you know, encourage it rather than as something terrible for terrible sake. Uh, you know, and even I wouldn't want to do that. I always come back to, yeah, of course you wouldn't want to do that, but the rules are different for you. This goes back to the rules might be different for certain kids uh, without OCD. And my kids, yes, I tell them to wash their hands after they touch a toilet. And yet I have kids that I'm treating here where I say, you're going to touch a toilet and spread it around and not wash your hands. Why is it different? It's different because my kids have the freedom without OCD to do it and they don't have that freedom. I always tell parents, I'm not saying they're gonna to rub toilets for the rest of their lives. Once they have the freedom to do that and not give in to OCD, then they can make that choice. But right now the rules have to be different because they don't have that freedom to make that choice. So what are some of the, the new tools? I think one of the um, things that we're trying to, to develop our, how can they respond in a way that's going to break the cycle Jamie mm -hmm. was talking about. Mm -hmm. And removing differential attention. I think anxiety gets an extreme amount of attention. It's alarming to everyone. So I think that t really training parents to say, we are not going to, you know, stop everything we're doing. We are not going to say, oh, we were on our way to school, but now OCD is upset about something. So we've got to stop everything and, and go to school late that we want to be able to say, no, we've we're going to reinforce being brave and standing up to the OCD bully. Uh, we're not going to reinforce giving in to its demands. I often tell parents if a if someone if, if it was a physical bully on the way to school and they said, uh, you know, stop and give this person your lunch money. How many parents would encourage the kid to say, yeah, I think you should be late to school because you're giving this kid your lunch money. They'd say, no, get out of there, go to school. That's the exact same attitude we've got to have with the OCD. So we gotta make sure we're not reinforcing the anxiety. I think modeling the brave behavior, I, I am. I, I think this goes back to what we were talking about, having parents watch us mm -hmm. with the kids mm -hmm. and have them see that their kid might be screaming and crying and upset. And I'm okay with that, that I'm not freaking out, that I am not alarmed and that we're able to say, yeah, you're feeling uncomfortable. Let's just keep going. All right, let's sit with the feeling. Yeah, this is hard, but let's just keep sitting with it. Uh, that's that's really important for parents to learn how to model because if they are panicking, that's going to you know, create this whole cycle all over again. Externalizing the OCD is key, and I think this is one of the things we're constantly encouraging both our patients to do, but our families to do too. It, it also helps take 
that you versus me mentality. It's more we're a team against the OCD. So being able to say, like, gosh, I'm so mad that the OCD is giving you such a hard time. I know that the OCD is demanding I answer that question, but I am not willing to make you sicker. I know that the OCD wants this, and I'm so sorry it's making you uncomfortable but I'm not going to let that bully tell you what to do. It doesn't get to tell me what to do. This is a family uniting against the OCD rather than fighting against the person, which is what often happens in that drama triangle. And I think zooming out, being able to see the big picture, you know, looking at not getting so overwhelmed by the emotion in that moment where we can respond uh, to a thought, not react in an immediate alarmed way. Uh, that That's a, a challenge for family members often because these symptoms mm -hmm. themselves are alarming mm -hmm. for them. So it's, it's always coming back to that, turn down the volume on your reaction. I think that's the biggest thing I'm telling family is mm -hmm. if you are reacting a lot, you're sending a bad message. Mm -hmm. I think we have uh, maybe four, four or five minutes. Okay. Three, four minutes, and then we'll take some questions. And I know Laura and I actually included some additional slides on here too. Yeah. That really more for your reference to have. Uh, we knew that this is a lot of information <laughs> in a short amount of time. Yeah. Um, but we'll we'll get to your questions shortly too. Yeah. This reframing the rituals is dangerous. I've already mentioned that. The inconvenience review. I think that. This is a lot for parents that are resistant to uh, doing some of the things we're doing to make rituals more inconvenient. Yeah. So this is where I have had parents say, I, I actually want them to read some of mm -hmm. these costs before they respond to their child in a, in a ritualistic way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every time I check the door, I'm welcoming OCD into my spouse's life. I am purposefully making them sicker mm -hmm. by buying more soap. I'm guaranteeing my child won't be an independent adult. That is a very hard thing to say and then go buy more soap. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually find that inconvenience review to be very, very helpful for loved ones and for patients. I think these were two of our slides that we kind of had here more on reference. Um, we could have whole talks on these two things, but um, parents of adult children with OCD, which just a quick note, I think we are seeing that a lot. Um, emerging adults still kind of enmeshed at home, a lot of time a failure to launch, uh, but, a, but a lot of accommodation going on there. And then certainly there's unique factors in considering um, accommodation between spouses and partners. Um, what I do want to hit on, and just maybe the last minute or two before questions, is this idea of a behavioral contract. So this is really, um, I think, when you're you're really getting in there and defining the new the new rules and responsibilities and roles of everybody. So this is just a quick example of the steps of a contract. In a, in a recent case that I did a contract with, uh, here Jay is a. Um, uh, a, a client afraid of germs and contamination and uh, family members, k &L, were doing all sorts of things to kind of really permit avoidance, give other means, lots of ways to clean, wash, etc. The first step was to identify just a specific OCD behavior that they could begin to eliminate the accommodation with. So the thing we kind of started with that challenging but doable range and, and defined this as, you know, uh, Jay was afraid to touch faucets in her bathroom. Uh, those felt those felt dirty more. Um, uh, guests used that bathroom. Siblings um, did not feel clean. Uh, what was the requested accommodation in the family's response? Jay was asking parents to use their bathroom. It felt safer. It was the master bathroom. Just them uh, wanted to use that exclusively. Um, uh, the parents would try to convince convince her to use her own bathroom. She would not. Uh, became very stubborn, resistant, and uh, eventually had become to use parents' bathroom, um, often when when they were still asleep, it was really not easy on them to, to, to have that going on, but they did it because it seemed to make life easier. Um, the goal, we wanted Jay to be able to use her own bathroom, and parents refrain from accommodating. Um, and what we said, too, is at this point, if Jay feels she can't use her own bathroom, she has to take the autonomy, you know, be autonomous and figure out what else to do for herself. So there were other bathrooms, there were other things. But what we were saying is that that bathroom was, was off limits. 
Um, we defined what everybody's rule was. So family members were gonna respond alternatively with a statement from our what to say list, which I know we've included here, but this is that, you know, externalizing the OCD, being supportive, but not accommodating. And we gave uh, Jay some autonomy and being able to say, I think that's one that I could hear. Um, when anxious, um, she was going to, she kind of picked her own strategies that worked well for her so that she was going to do her one minute at a time. I'm going to delay this need to walk, wash, wait it out, and that she would be engaging in her ER homework as we were working specifically on these things in session as well. And then family members would, of course, uh, refrain from the accommodation, allowing their, the use of their bathroom um, or any way of making washing easier. We had to, of course, monitor progress. So we did weekly check-ins, um, making sure things were going well, uh, troubleshooting. We actually used a tally system for the number of times that this was this continued to happen. I think all the family members said this is going to be hard for us. This is going to be difficult. We don't know if we can we can, you know, do this. But we began to have them track that and attach that to a, a really meaningful reward for Jay, which was going out to breakfast on the weekends with her family as we saw those reductions that was that was earned. Um, let's see. So this is just a list of what you can say. This is kind of for your reference, things that you can say. And then also a really helpful handout, which is the family members do's and don'ts. Um, and a couple a couple just language to use uh, if you hear these things if you hear these these myths if you hear these misconceptions what you can say in response and you know it's about that time um we'll, we can do some questions let me see i'm gonna oops, see if i can get helen's um, thank you so much, Jamie, and Laura, for your excellent presentation. We're now going to begin answering the questions that were submitted during the presentation. As a reminder to everybody, you can still submit questions. Um, Laura and uh, let me just put my just to say okay, okay. Um, here's our first question. What about children who have been used to tremendous amounts of reassurance and other accommodations and act out with anger and tantrums when it is reduced, even when they have been educated as to why their OCD monster needs to stop being fed? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest challenge we have there is really preparing parents for that. That, that I would say, is the rule rather than the exception in most of our cases, is that mm -hmm. kids can understand all day long what the rules are going to be, but they are still going to lash out when they're in pain. And that's really what I prep parents for is saying, you've got to understand she is saying all the things that she understands the plan, but when your her OCD attacks, that is going to go into panic mode and it's going to either be tears and sad begging or it's going to be screaming and angry lashing out. But this is where you have to prepare the parents. Any kind of behavioral change, we are staying the course. You know, there are limits we have as parents. And I say to parents, to me, this is like your child saying, but I want to run out into traffic on the highway. It's not negotiable. Like this is at this point, we have decided this is not working and this is making your child sicker. So we have got to just see it as that serious of a change. And we've got to expect we are going to stay the course. And so giving them strategies for ignoring, you know, trying to wait out the tantrums, trying to come up with strategies. If you have a high intensity kid that needs some self-soothing to work through those. But, you know, I do think a big part of it is just saying this is not negotiable. Right. And I would point to you to um, Eli Lebowitz's work on the um, kind of coercive, disrupt disruptive behaviors. Um, when uh, children are asking for that accommodation, but really, really bad behavior, uh, manipulative to make that work. Um, and the, the role of the, the need for control in that. And so I know I'm always thinking about there are non-negotiable parts of this, but I'm gonna try to see what I can get this kid to feel they have a say over, like even that list of choo like choosing statements from that list. Yeah, I think that, that yeah, I think that those are the things that we can allow. I think giving in is the part that's the non-negotiable, but choosing where we start, choosing what statements the kids are okay with mm -hmm. hearing. I've had 
you know, I've had some teenagers who say, I don't even want to hear mom and dad say that, but I'm okay with a, a code word or, a, you know, like if they say, oh, but that's your OCD talking. I've had some teenagers that'll say, give it a name. Like, yeah. hey, Laura left a message. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I think that the, those things are definitely negotiable. But once we get in the moment, if yeah. we have a plan set in place, the parents have to be prepared not to deviate from it. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Jamie and Laura, a second question a bit along the same lines. How do you coach parents to ride out extreme reactions or self-harming behaviors when they withhold accommodations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar topic here. It's that disruptive kind of coercive uh, uh, thing happening. And I think um, really what it comes down to to, in my mind is it's that that parents ability to kind of regulate their own emotions in in the face of that um, and so I think that's where we get a lot of the the coaching aspects of that um, it's also not uncommon uh, that you know we I've worked with some parents who who need even their own psychotherapy uh, partly because of that distress tolerance component not that that's that's always the case um, but that's really, I think, the thing that's that's at play. And I know we've had a couple examples where we we do have the kiddos who are threatening um, the self harm, um, et cetera. And so uh, that's really tough for parents. That's really tough to know what, what I know you have. It's very very hard. Parents. Yeah, I, I had a case um, just this past year of a, a child who said to me and and to the parents in no uncertain terms, and this was a child who had in fact engaged in a suicide attempt in the past. Um, it, he said, you know, if you make me go to school, school was uh, dangerous because of OCD's rules, I will kill myself and it will be all your fault. So this was a really, really hard thing, but this was one of those things where the parents and I talked about it and I said, essentially, we are going to teach him that if your distress gets high enough, this is an effective coping strategy is to threaten to hurt yourself. If we say, if we change other rules, if everything goes out the window because you've said that. So what we said in place is we really prepared him for, we take it seriously if you say these things. And we are are absolutely going to act, but it's not going to be uh, a going not going to school. It's going to be no secondary going game. To, yeah, there's right. not going to be a secondary game. We're going to immediately go to the psyche R, for example. Um, so I, I think it's an extreme case, but it's one where these parents needed a lot of extra support and encouragement along the way because it was very very hard for them to stay the course. Thank you so much. I think, in fact, you've already answered the third question, which was, what about those who threaten self-harm if family accommodation is removed? I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, just that I think that that deserves a presentation in and of itself. Um, <laughs> that, that, that I think that that is the yeah. trickiest, the, the, the trickiest of all scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think a lot of it, assessment, conceptualization, helping the family. It is that balance of staying the course, helping everybody, parents regulate their emotional state um, and taking away the secondary gains of, Thank you. of that. Yeah. And we have had cases where, especially not so much with younger children, but with older teens, where we may say there needs to be co-occurring DBT happening, yeah, that sure. th there are clear skill deficits that this person has that are interfering in their ability to uh, comply with the ERP program. So yeah. I think that that's not uncommon for us to, to do that if necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a last question here. Do you suggest implementing family rules in graduated way, such as only answering a question once? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we try and have very clear I think that this is so much more helpful for the parents. I, as a parent with three small kids, like it is chaos day to day. If you make it complicated for parents, I think they are not going to stick to it. So we don't want to give them a hundred different rules for every scenario. We want to make it really easy. And I think having a, an easy scenario, like you are, you can answer any question one time and that's it. And that's the exact same rule that happens in our session. Uh, that's something that parents can stick to and be able to feel confident in. Uh, so having, um, and like I said, not making a rule of everyone in the family takes care of their own chores or everyone in the family is going to be allowed to talk about whatever they want to. I do think those universal family rules uh, are really important and take away some of the, the renegotiating that right. can happen without them.
And I know I will gradually add to the behavioral contract. So yes. people are starting with the challenging but doable and we're adding to that mm -hmm. um, over time. Thank you so much, uh, Jamie and Laura, and thank you to our participants for attending today's webinar. You'll receive a follow-up email within an hour that includes a link to the evaluation and also a link to the recording of the webinar. Please do share your thoughts, even if you're not requesting C. If you're not yet an ADA member, please consider becoming one. ADA offers an excellent member's benefits package, such as year-long access to continuing education, free access to special interest groups, including peer online consultation groups, such as one on OCD, significant discount to ADA's annual four-day conference, promotion of your practice in ADA's online Find a Therapist database, and much more. We hope you will join us at the Anxiety and Depression Conference this April 5th to 8th in Washington, D.C. And on behalf of ADA and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.